friends welcome to another video tutorial from Shomu's biology in this video lecture we'll be talking about GPCR associated cell signaling process in the last two videos we've been talking about what is signal transduction pathway what are the components of signal transduction pathway and how signal transduction pathway actually work now in this video we will see what is uh, one type of that signal transduction pathway which uh, is associated with G protein and G protein coupled receptor and most of this G protein coupled receptor mediated signal transduction pathway involves in the association of other growth factors as a signaling molecule. Now once those growth factor interacts with this GPCR it further conveys the signal inside the cell uh, to produce all the proteins necessary for the cell to grow and divide and proliferate. So let's look at the process. Now when you are studying any of the cell signaling processes, uh, it's must, you should know few things about that pathway. Uh, first of the, uh, all, you should know about what is a signaling molecule. So signaling molecule that is the actual first messenger that brings the signal from outside. In case of the GPCR coupled signaling, we will see most of the cases this is the growth hormone or it's associated with the growth factors. Example of such is let's say epidermal growth factor. Now second one is the GP, the, the, the receptor of the signaling molecule. In this case, the receptor is this GPCR or G protein coupled receptor. Now G protein coupled receptor when bound with EGF, those type of receptor is named after EGF as EGFR or epidermal growth factor receptor. And the third case is the what, what are the type of uh, conveyor or signal conveyor. In this case, signal conveyor is G protein. Now the fourth thing, fourth component is the, the, the signal transducers. In this case, the signal transducer starts with it starts with cyclic AMP, which is also acting as a second messenger. Okay, so these are the different components that 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 we need to know for any of the cell signaling processes for G protein coupled signaling. These are the things that we work with. Now let's talk about the process of this signaling. Now the signaling molecule is epidermal growth factor or it can be platelet derived growth factor or any kind of growth factor. And once the growth factor attaches to the signal receptor, they ultimately dictates the signaling in a way that allows the cell to grow and divide and process and progress to, through the cell cycle phases. Now the receptor is GPCR, G protein coupled receptor. Now GPCR has its characteristic structure. GPCR is also known as a 7 transmembrane receptor because this is a protein which is transmembrane protein embedded 7 times. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and 7. So 7 times transmem it actually transpans the membrane 7 times that's why it's known as 7 TM receptor. Now this receptor has specific cytosolic domain which gets activated when it's attached with that specific signaling molecule in this case that is uh, EGF. So when GPCR interacts with EGF cytosolic domain of of this GPCR gets a little activation. Uh, it's a little modification. It's not a covalent change, but it's a modification. And this modified and activated version of the GPCR then interacts with the, the conveyor that is G protein. Now G protein is a membrane anchored protein mostly. It has three different structural units. It has the alpha domain. This is alpha. It also have a beta domain and a gamma domain. The beta domain, however, is smaller and it's not anchored to the membrane. Alpha and gamma are only anchored domain to the membrane. So this is the G protein and how the G protein looks like. Okay. Now once the activation of GPCR is made by the interaction with EGF, this GPCR interacts with this G protein. 
in the cytosolic leaflet of the cell. And then this interaction allows the exchange of GTP, I mean exchange of GDP with GTP to this G protein. Now why it is called the G protein? Because for the activation of this protein, they require GTP. Normally this G protein is GDP bound. Once it's GDP bound, it's inactive. But once the GDP is substituted and released by GTP, it gets activated. So that's what is mediated by the presence of this activation domain of the 7 transmembrane receptor or GPCR here. So it helps in this transfer. So GDP released, GTP attaches. That allows this, this G protein to be separated from the different subunits. So as you know, there are three subunits. This substitution caused this alpha subunit to get separated from beta gamma subunit. So we have only alpha subunit now. Beta gamma is gone. So let me, uh, gone means it's actually separated, but it's definitely attached to the membrane here. So beta gamma units are separated. GTP is attached to the alpha unit and it's now active. Now this active portion, or activated subunit of G protein, further activates another membrane bound or membrane attached uh, enzyme you can say that is known as adenylyl cyclase. Now this is the adenylyl cyclase enzyme. This adenylyl cyclase gets activated by this alpha subunit of G protein. Once adenylyl cyclase gets active, it can convert ATP into cyclic AMP. It's simply uh, a cross-linking of the phosphate uh, in the ATP to convert it into the cyclic AMP. Once cyclic AMP is produced inside the cell, that acts as the first response inside the cell. So this cyclic AMP acts as the first signaling molecule that starts to convey the message of the growth factor intracellularly. That's why this cyclic AMP is also known as second messenger because this EGF here is the primary messenger or the first messenger and this is the second messenger. So then the cyclic AMP can activate even further other proteins like protein kinase A, let's say that protein. So multiple downstream signal transducers will be activated by cyclic AMP. One such is this protein kinase A. So, so let's say this PKA, PKA or protein kinase A, have, it's, a, it's a multiple structural unit protein. They have two different structural unit, uh, a regulatory unit and the activation unit or enzymatic unit. Now cyclic AMP, once it's attached to this regulatory units, it deactivates the regulatory units by changing its structure that allows this enzymatic unit to become free. Now this protein kinase enzymatic units, as their kinase enzyme, they have the capability of phosphorylating other downstream molecules. So they keep phosphorylating other molecules. And then finally, they activate the transcription factor. In this case, the example is CREB. So it's kind of a response element activating factor. This response element is a part of the gene, is part of the DNA that is present inside the nucleus. Once CREB is active, CREB goes inside the nucleus, bind with the specific uh, response element in, in, in the gene that allows the transcription of further downstream proteins which allows to produce more and more cyclines and other type of proteins that will help the cell to grow and that will help the cell to divide and pass from G1 to S to G2 and finally through the M phase of the cell cycle. That is the idea of the growth factor. This is one way of how GPCR mediated signaling work. But there is another way of also how the GPCR signaling works. It's not by activating cyclic AMP. In that case, we will see that the second messenger will be different one, okay? That will be PI3 as a second messenger. What was that? The same thing start happening from the beginning that this GPCR interacts with epidermal growth factor or let's say any other factors in that case. It's, let's say it's also a growth factor and uh, that allows 
uh, the GPCR2 modify, the G protein gets activated. And so similarly, this activated GPCR activates the G protein by substituting GDP with GTP. But instead of activating at an allyl cyclase, that activated G protein interacts with another membrane bound component known as PIP2, phosphat phosphatidyl inositol diphosphate. Okay? Now, once it involves in the interaction of PIP2, it cleaves PIP2 into two components and two fragments. Let's look at that. Let's look that uh, here now. In this case, let's extend uh, this cell membrane a little bit to talk about the structure and process. Let's see here, oh, it's not straight enough. Okay. Now here again, the same situation. It's activation. Let's say this is uh, the G protein that we see, the alpha unit, attached with GTP. It's, it's in active form. Then it interacts with that PIP2. So let's say this is this is PIP2 phosphatidylinositol diphosphate. So now once we see that this G protein gets activated by the substitution of GDP with GTP, now this G protein activates another enzyme inside the cell that is known as phospholipase C. This is a lipase enzyme or lipase, whatever you say. The job of lipase enzyme is to cleave lipids. So, phospholipase C cleaves the membrane attached lipid that is PIP2, phosphatidyl inositol diphosphate, right? And in this case, not diphosphate, it is bisphosphate. Now, you know the difference between diphosphate and bisphosphate? Is diphosphate is when the phosphate groups are attached one by another attached itself. Bisphosphate is the phosphate groups are attached in different location of the molecule. Okay? So, this is di, this is bis. Now, this phospholipase C cleaves phosphatidyl inositol bisphosphate that generates diacylglycerol that will remain attached with the membrane and a cleaved fragment known as IP3 that will be released. Now, in this case, I will erase this PLC and then we explain the detailed process. But the activation and cleavage of PIP2 is mediated by the lipase phospholipase C and that in turn is activated by the alpha subunit of the G protein. Two, it cleaves PIP2 into two fragments. One of the fragment after the cleave gets released out. So, the fragment that keeps released out will be known as inositol triphosphate because one phosphate group is added also so we call it IP3. The other structure remains attached to the membrane and it's known as diacylglycerol. So two, two, two part of the glycerol unit is embedded to the membrane. Diacylglycerol remain attached to the membrane while inositol triphosphate gets released out of the PIP2 structure. Now this inositol triphosphate can do multiple job inside. It can activate protein kinase C, which will bring further physiological activities there. And this PIP3, which does a multiple job, another very important job of IP3 is IP3 goes and interacts with specific receptors in the ER membrane. So let me draw the endoplasmic reticulum here. Let us say this is the endoplasmic reticulum and this is the membrane of ER and you see in the membrane of ER there are channel proteins present known as calcium channels because ER lumen is filled with calcium. So, lots of calcium are present inside the ER lumen. lot of calciums are present inside the ear lumen and once this IP3 interacts and bind with 
this calcium channels they will allow the calcium to flow out right so calcium 2 will flow out to the cytosol from the er lumen so it will increase the calcium concentration in the cytosol that changes the membrane potential because cell normally have a resting membrane potential but the resting membrane potential will be changed because we have a lot of positive ions positive charge in the cytosolic domain so that change in the the membrane potential will do ultimately different jobs like in case of polyspermy prevention in case of polyspermy prevention in uh, sea urchin fertilization once uh, the sperm take entry uh, by donating its nucleus into the egg cell after the process is done once one sperm have done the job they have a decision to prevent multiple sperm to take entry because that will lead to the death of the embryo so to prevent that once the first fertilization is already done they increase the calcium concentration in inside the cytosol that allows to alter the 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 electric or membrane potential across the membrane of the of, of the sea urchin egg which will prevent further sperm to take entry so this is one of the example of calcium ion release into the cytosol it also helps some cases for the muscle contraction because a lot of calcium ions move from the er lumen to the cytosol allows uh, the cell to finally do the contraction and other part of the job that also is very very important for uh, the heart muscle to work and also in other parts of our body so that is uh, the overview of how gpcr which is a same single receptor interacting with growth factors and other type of factors depending upon what kind of factor that they will interact what kind of signaling molecules that they interact the downstream signaling can completely alter it can can be completely changed uh, over the time so it's all about the combination of the signaling molecule and the receptor depending upon this combination they change the internal internal activation of other con signal conveyors and signal con transducer molecules that ultimately relates uh, to different type of physiological activities in our body so that in a sense is a gpcr signaling processes both involving the the adenylyl cyclase and cyclic amp mediated process and with the help of ip3 mediated process now in case of the first process as i told you cyclic amp was the first signal transducer inside the cell to convey the signal so we call it second messenger similarly here in case of this side of the cell signaling with the help of uh, the pip2 breakdown and production of ip3 this ip3 act as the second messenger because in this case this ip3 is the first type of molecules here develop that will transfer that will transfer its component and that will start the process of transduction inside that's why this is ip3 here is acting as a second messenger in case of uh, this this calcium mediated pathway so calcium as i told you can be taken for polyspermy prevention or also the muscle contraction but also calcium can also activate further calcium me, uh, mediated or calcium dependent uh, enzymes or calcium dependent signaling molecules such as calcium binding proteins like calmodulin that also involved in the process of other cell signaling crosstalk between the cell living and growth pathways but this process is never deal with the cell death pathways most of the cases this gpcr associated signaling are related to the cell growth and proliferation pathways so that in a sense is the gpcr associated cell signaling if you like this video please hit the like button subscribe to my channel to get more and more videos like that share this video with your friends thank you